Welcome back to PJGH Education. My name is Stephen, and today we're continuing our series on the Acts of the Apostles. This is Acts chapter 19, verses 21 to 41, episode number 33, and the title is Impact. Now, after these events, what events? Events that happened in Ephesus, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Now, Acts chapter 19 verse 21 begins a new or final section or the last panel in the Acts of the Apostles where we journey from uh, uh, Ephesus to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to Rome. Now, in the previous episode, we have chapter 19 verse 20, which completes the uh, panel on the second and third missionary journey with the verse, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So now we are looking at the beginning of the final section or the last panel of the book of, uh, of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Now, so here we are in Ephesus. This is the map right in the middle in Asia, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And soon we will make the trip back uh, to Jerusalem, if you look at uh, verse 21, that basically outlines the program for the remainder of the book. From Ephesus here to pass through Macedonia to the northwest and Achaia to the west of uh, Asia. And then from there to go on to Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, say, after I've been there in Jerusalem, I must also see Rome. And in Jerusalem, he suffered a lot and he ended up imprisoned in Caesarea Maritima for two years. Now, the question then is this phrase, resolved in the spirit, uh, that the English Standard Version, the ESV, uh, translates from the Greek, uh, holds the epleurothe tauta, Etheto ho Paulos and to Pneumati. So the Etheto and to Pneumati, which I uh, highlight in bold, that means resolved in the spirit. Now the question then is whether this in the spirit refers to in the spirit of God. If this is the spirit of God, then we can say with confidence that Paul's trip back to Jerusalem was a uh, was dictated by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wanted Paul to uh, return to Jerusalem, be imprisoned there for two years, and from there move on to Rome. And this, uh, this sense is also carried by the New Living Translation, the NLT. Afterward, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to uh, Macedonia, compelled by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, with capital letter S. Um, other translations are not so convinced. The King James Version says, After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, where we have a small letter S referring to Paul's human spirit. Paul purposed in his human spirit and not by the Spirit of God or in the Spirit of God. The uh, NASB carried the same sense. Now, after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the the spirit. Now, the phrase purpose in the spirit, if it refers to the human spirit with a small letter S, then maybe for clarity in the English, we can even translate it as in uh, as per the NIV. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. So purpose in the spirit to go to Jerusalem, decided to go to Jerusalem if the spirit there refers to his human spirit, of course. Uh, and the NET, the New English Translation, uh, has that same sense. Now, after all these things had taken place, Paul resolved to go to Jerusalem. So the Paul decided in his human spirit, that is, he resolved to go to Jerusalem, or was he compelled by the Holy Spirit, capital letter S, uh, resolved in the spirit, as per the English Standard Version? Uh, it's hard to tell. So the difference would be, was he instructed by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, or was he determined in his own spirit to do so. That means he made that determination apart from the Holy Spirit. And that would uh, impact the way you, you interpret Paul's journey back to 
uh, Jerusalem? And uh, that remains an open question and uh, discussions continue with regard to this verse as you can see from uh, the decisions made by the various translators. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. So the temple of Artemis built in the 6th century BCE and destroyed and rebuilt in the 4th century before Common Era. And it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the principal deity of Ephesus. And it was a source of income, both tourism and the souvenir industry. Therefore, craftsmen who made uh, little statues of the goddess to be sold to pilgrims and to um, travelers. These he gathered together with uh, the workmen in similar trades and said, Man, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods, and there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. So this is Demetrius' uh, speech to the idol-making guild, the Artemis shrine-making business generated wealth for the guild members. And Paul's claim that handmade gods were not gods turned away many people in Ephesus and throughout Asia. That means you would lose business as a result of which Paul's ministry threatened to bring the idol-making trade into disrepute. And the Greek word for threatened, it means endangers, uh, kindu new a. And we're going to be looking at this word in just uh, in more detail in just a little bit. Uh, Paul's ministry threatened to render the temple of Artemis irrelevant because more and more people were turning to God. More and more people were becoming believers in Jesus Christ and turn away from idolatry, turn away from the worship of Artemis. So Paul's ministry could depose Artemis, who's worshipped in Asia and the whole world. And that means basically money, right, from her magnificence. So uh, worship throughout Asia and the whole world. Think about it. If uh, Artemis is deposed in, uh, in Ephesus, and so uh, it's no longer worshipped or... Uh, the worship of Artemis is significantly reduced, then that would bring in fewer um, uh, uh, pilgrims, fewer um, tourists, and fewer um, souvenir buyers. Uh, and that would be bad for business, basically. So when they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion and they rushed together into the theater, uh, which the great theater of Ephesus has a capacity of 20,000 to 25,000, and dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him, and even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Paul Fears nothing, isn't it? There's a mob going on. It's like, great, is Artemis of the Ephesians, and they drag out Gaius and Aristarchus, uh, Paul's friends, and he thought that he was going to go in among the crowd to, to explain, to give a defense of what they're doing, but uh, it was way too dangerous, and his friends would not allow him. But Paul, he, he was fearless. He, he, he couldn't care less about uh, his own life. He's very much more interested in the advancement of the gospel. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why they had come together. The assembly was in chaos because most of them did not know the purpose of the gathering. They knew that someone was shouting, uh, Great is the Artemis of the Ephesus. So they thought that maybe Artemis was uh, under threat and this is very critical and central, integral to their identity as Ephesians. So it roused some kind of um, patriotism among the crowd. Uh, but in reality, it was 
uh, instigated by the profiteers, profit making, uh, uh, idol making guild, and they didn't want to lose business uh, because of the decrease in the demand for um, carvings of Artemis. They're afraid for their own rice bowl. So what they did, they um, roused patriotism, and that can be rather blinding because it was ideological. So some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd, but when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is the Artem great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now the Jews put forward Alexander to make a defense. Why? This wasn't this a, uh, a Christian issue. Why did the Jews have to make um, uh, a defense for for Judaism? Now the reason is because the Gentiles could not differentiate the Messianic and non-Messianic Jews. Jews who believe in Jesus as the Messiah and Jews who do not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. For both. Uh, Messianic and non-Messianic Jews were against idolatry, right? So they were just Judaism, one same religion. But here's the question. Uh, the Jews have been there for a very long time in Ephesus, and uh, the people did not gather and uh, exclaim, great is Artemis of the Ephesians uh, uh, because of them. Uh, the um, guilt making the sorry the idol making guilt demetrius and his friends they were not threatened they don't feel threatened by uh the mere presence of uh of jews the mere presence of jew jewish people did not reduce uh significantly the uh, number of people who would buy the idols crafted by them there was no impact whatsoever and that's the title of our uh of of of, of this particular episode impact there was no real impact of uh jewish people being uh in, in ephesus in terms of reducing idolatry in the city but ever since paul arrived and he preached the gospel of jesus christ and he had some jewish people who uh, believe in jesus as the messiah and also uh, many other uh, Gentiles who came to faith in Jesus Christ, but and this one creates an impact. This one affected the business of the idol makers, and that is very, very key to our understanding of this passage. So upon learning that Alexander was a Jew, the crowd protested for another two hours. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Man of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? So his reaction is that, look, the city of the Ephesians was the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. Maybe it was a meteor or something like that. Uh, not a god made with human hands was his point. So uh, the accusation that uh, Paul made was uh, false, right? Because it was not a God made with human hands. It fell from the sky. So this, the, the town clerk says, was an indisputable fact that required no uh, defense. Now, seeing that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, for you have brought this man here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemous, of our goddess. So he says that those whom the crowd dragged into the theater were neither sacrilegious, uh, that is, Hierosulus, that is, temple robbers, nor blasphemers of Artemis. And this is a claim both Demetrius and Paul himself would dispute. Paul would blaspheme Artemis. And uh, uh, Demetrius would claim that uh, Paul would be a temple robber because uh, robbing people of uh, robbing Artemis of adherence, uh, robbing the idol-making guild of their prophets. So the Kaukak is not really uh, correct uh, right here. There is real impact of the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ upon the city of Ephesus and her worship of Artemis. Now, if therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against 
anyone, the courts are open. And there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly or the regular ecclesia. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen wanted to sue anyone, they could do so in the courts. And this is a signal really uh, to what was what happened to Paul eventually in Jerusalem, whereby there was just these crowds and mob and riots, uh, but there were courts available. Uh, there's the Roman authorities available, and Paul appealed to Caesar. And now Paul, uh, being in Rome, eventually having to make a defense. And episodes like this would serve as uh, as precedents of how Roman law ought to deal with matters such as this. Uh, for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. So it says the assembled crowd itself was in danger and this is a play of words, isn't it? Uh, in the Greek kindunomen of being charged with rioting, which is, remember, uh, kindunio A, Paul's ministry threatened or endangers uh, to bring the idol-making trade into disrepute but rather the assembled crowd itself was in danger continuum of being charged with rioting. But I suppose my main point, the main point that I want to bring across uh, in this episode is impact. The impact of the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ. If Christians want to make real impact in their cities, real impact in their communities, then do what Paul did. Uh, to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, to preach Christ crucified, to preach the word of God, to invite people to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. And when people do that, all through history, we see that when there is such a revival, a spiritual revival, people giving themselves to Jesus Christ and to the gospel that, he, uh, that, that is preached in his name, uh, and when they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit comes into their life and we see large-scale revival all through history and also right here in Ephesus, what happens? The society is impacted. In the case of uh, Ephesus, there was a, uh, a, a reduction of idolatry and the worship of Artemis and the society realized uh, that that happened. Um, and in our own communities, there could be other things, other uh, sinful ways of our uh, society that sometimes as Christians, we feel compelled to say something about it, to do something about it. Uh, and that those things are all good things, all right things to do. But most importantly, the power, the source uh, of, of how to bring that uh, social change about is through the uh, preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, there will be real impact. So God bless you. See you in the next episode.